And we're going to be this morning in Psalm 78. So open your Bibles, please, to Psalm 78. Smed this week is uh, dropping his daughter off uh, at college, freshman year of college. So pray for him and Janet. I'm sure that's a sweet and a, and a sad time. But he'll be back next week in the book of Revelation. But this week we're going to be in Psalm 78. And if you, uh, if you invite a missionary up to preach, they're probably going to you know, preach on a, a missions passage. Well, if you invite the, the youth guy up to preach, I do the, the youth ministry here at the church, then you're probably going to get a, a passage about raising up the next generation. And, and that's exactly what this passage is about, uh, raising up a generation of those who fear the Lord. So Psalm 78, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the passage this morning, uh, just the first eight verses we're going to be looking at. I'm going to read the passage, and then I'm going to just pray for our time together. So read Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8 with me. Asaph writes, Listen, O my people, to my instruction, and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works which he has done. For he has established a testimony in Jacob, and he has appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Would you pray with me? God, uh, as we come to your word, as we come to, to hear from you, I pray that we would have teachable hearts. I pray that we would have humble hearts. Uh, I pray that we would have worshipful hearts, thankful hearts. And I pray that we would receive this instruction to, to raise up the next generation, that you would raise up in this church even a, a generation of those who fear you, who love you, who are able to then instruct a generation yet to be born of your truth, of your goodness, of your gospel message. Jesus, we pray these things for your glory, for your name. Amen. When I was 10 years old, my parents took me and my brother to Pasadena, California for the Rose Bowl football game. If you're not familiar with the Rose Bowl, it's one of the oldest, I think it's the oldest college football game that's still running, the oldest bowl game. Uh, and if you grew up on the West Coast, it was the, the biggest football game of the year, at least when I grew up. And we went January 1997 to watch Arizona State play, uh, the last time that they played in the Rose Bowl. So I've waited now 25 years, you know, watching ASU football year after year. Is this going to be the year? Is this going to be the year? And then I have sons, two sons, and that now the anticip anticipation is higher. Am I going to be able to take my boys to see the Rose Bowl? And then about two weeks ago, uh, the landscape of college football changed uh, in a matter of days. And Arizona State is not in the same conference, probably not even going to play in the Rose Bowl anymore. And I'm left looking at this, just asking this question, well, what, about, what about tradition? What about legacy? What about my boys? You know, we've waited 25 years to go to the Rose Bowl. <laughs> and you don't have to care about college football. That's okay. It's okay if you're not as burdened as I am. But, but I, think that, I, think that that, I think that's a microcosm of just the world that we're in. You look around at a world that doesn't seem to care much for tradition, for legacy, for, for history. You know, as monuments get turned over, uh, defaced, uh, as, as, as you see uh, street names even changed, historical building names changed, uh, you, you're left to wonder what, what's going to be left for our children. You know, a hundred-year-old institution changed overnight. And you may be asking the same question, doesn't anyone care about legacy? Doesn't anyone care about tradition? Or maybe the more pertinent question, doesn't anyone care about our children? You know, what world are they going to be in 20 years from now? What are we going to be able to pass on to them? We live in a culture that seems like it has no regard for what came before and very little concern for what comes after. And here in the church, we are different, fundamentally different, because we are rooted in the past. We are grounded in the, the history of what God has done for his people. 
And at the same time, we are committed to raising up another generation of those who will fear the Lord. That, that's what this passage is all about. The commitment of God's people to raise up another generation. Looking at the past, looking at what God has done in the past, and then looking forward at this, this task, this command from Jesus to make disciples. So my hope is that this morning that this passage would just light a fire in you to, to pursue this with, with more zeal, that you would be more zealous of this task that we might call generational discipleship, to raise up another generation of those who would hope in God. So we're going to see in this passage four pillars of raising up the next generation. Uh, pillars like supports of a building, a foundation. So this passage is going to lay a foundation for us to reinforce this is what it takes to go after the next generation. Uh, there's a, a principle in the financial world that says uh, about generational wealth. It says that, that wealth, generational wealth usually doesn't last beyond three generations. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, who was uh, the richest man in the world in the 1800s, started the American steel industry. He, he coined this saying that says, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. And what he means is a, a white t-shirt worker to white t-shirt worker in three generations. That is to say that the first generation, they work hard, they make the money, they take the risks and the sacrifice. The second generation, they see their parents working, they appreciate the sacrifice, and they just try not to lose this wealth. So they, they protect the money, but they don't grow it. And by the third generation, they haven't seen the sacrifice. They don't appreciate what it costs. And so they spend the money. That's the principle, a generational wealth gone in three generations. And our focus here is, is not concerned so much about financial resources, but, but a different kind of treasure, God's truth passed on to us. Will we be a generation that passes this truth on to the next generation? Uh, we have this duty to d disciple and train up the next generation of, of leaders. So the first pillar here in this uh, four-legged structure Raising up the next generation is the duty. Every generation has to embrace this duty. You can't ride the wake of your parents' faith. This passage is going to give us some really practical things. Here is what we teach them, verses 4 and 5. But the psalm starts, the first three verses, with a, with a call. You see Asaph here is the, the author. Asaph is first introduced to us in the Bible as, a, as the choir director. He's a Levite, a priest. Uh, David actually uh, puts, puts Asaph as the, the leader of the, the processional when David brings the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. And you remember the scene when David is dancing in the streets. Well, Asaph is the one that's leading the music while David dances. He's a, a prophet, a seer he is called. And this prophetic songwriter here in Psalm 78 is leading the choir. This is a corporate worship. You, you could imagine Asaph in the middle of the assembly, this call to worship. Listen, my people. Imagine him standing in the middle of the people. We are going to worship the Lord together. Look at verse 2. He says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings. I'm giving here an introduction. This is what I'm about to tell you. These parables and dark sayings. Uh, these same words show up in the book of Proverbs uh, to talk about wisdom, the way that wisdom comes to us. So he's saying, I'm going to give you some truisms spiritual insights, uh, and even give it to you with a melody so you can remember it. Uh, dark sayings uh, could also be translated uh, riddle. So it's not, you know, dark sayings like, you know, he who must not be named, some magic spell or something, but, but a riddle that needs uh, enlightening, uh, deep truths that, that you must ponder. So the, the proverb that he's going to tell them, the story that he's going to unfold throughout this psalm is the, the history of Israel, uh, generation by generation that heard God's word, that rejected, and God was still faithful. So a call to the next generation to be faithful. And he starts here in verse 3, giving them the, the duty, the obligation. Look at verse 3. Which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. He reminds them of their privileged position. You are ones who have grown up hearing the truth, he is saying. There is a stewardship in view. We have heard, he's reminding them, all of us, we have heard these things. The truth was passed on from your parents and it must not stop with you. Asaph is encouraging them to take ownership, uh, stewardship. Uh, I think about Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 4 where he says, I'm a steward of the mysteries of God. You know, I have this treasure, I have received the word of God. And this treasure must not stop with me. I must guard it, but now I have an obligation to tell others. 
And as you read uh, biblical history and you read church history, you find tragic story and tragic generation after generation that, that heard the truth, that benefited from the truth, that, that received all of, the, all of the wonderful, rich benefits and security that the truth brought, but it stopped with them. And in the church, we could enjoy all of these benefits of, of church, of body life, relationships, uh, singing together, encouragement, people to, to carry our burdens. We could come here but miss the, the stewardship that we are part of this mission to, to, to go after the next generation, to, to let the gospel not stop with us. This is God's pattern throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament, uh, generational discipleship. Listen back at Genesis. Just listen to Genesis 18, verse 18 and 19. This is when God is giving his promise to Abraham. And he says of Abraham that Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation. In him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then he says, For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So the pattern of God's people from day one, when God established the nation of Israel with Abraham, these promises, was to teach these things to your children. Psalm 78 here is reaffirming God's covenant requirement. When God gives the the law on Mount Sinai, along with the giving of the law is this command to teach these things to your children. Always the home has been the, the epicenter of, of raising the next generation. The Israelite nation was assembled by household and clan. You could say that the, the nation rose and fell with the families in the nation. In the New Testament, the home still, this, this primary training ground, still the obligation of fathers and mothers to teach their children. You think about Ephesians 6.4, this command to fathers and mothers to instruct and discipline your children Titus 2, 3, and 4, the older women, the the women who have raised children are now instructing the younger women, and they instruct them to to be workers in the home, loving their husbands and their children. This is what you must go after, wives in the home. The same obligation for us in the New Testament. So if there are going to be strong churches, there have to be strong families. There have to be strong fathers and faithful mothers, teaching and training. And sometimes I've heard this question about youth ministry. Why, why do we have youth ministry? Isn't, isn't that the parent's job? Or maybe you could ask it a different way. Well, whose job is it to train the next generation? Is it the church or the parents? I think the answer is yes. We don't have to pit those two against each other, right? The church is coming alongside the parents, is strengthening the parents, is equipping the parents, is helping the parents, hopefully teaching the same truths as the parents, pushing children back to the parents. Hey, you need to obey your parents. Ephesians 6, children obey your parents in the Lord. These things are not at odds. The, the church and the parents together locked arms in this. But, but you do see in this passage the, the priority of the home. Verse 3, that the fathers have told us. And then verse 5, he commanded our fathers that they to teach them to their children. So the weight of this obligation, this duty, does rest with the fathers, with dads in the home, moms in the home. So if the church is going to survive past the current generation, It will take strong fathers, fathers who embrace this duty, fathers who take the responsibility, take the burden of leadership, who are the most proactive in their homes. We have such a a broken view of of leadership in our culture, and you end up even in the church with with these two different types of leaders. You have the the passive father, unwilling to, to work hard, unwilling to do what it takes, lazy and undisciplined not wanting to, to do hard things. Or you have the, the heavy-handed father, no, no problem demanding from others to, to meet his needs, selfish, right? But we need to be in, in the middle, the father who is the, the one who sacrifices most, who does the hard things, the, the chief servants, the ones who lead in discipline and discipleship. And at the same time, the, the most teachable, the most gentle. I heard one pastor read that he said uh, that men should govern their families with a steel hand covered with a velvet glove. Or I came across this quote, uh, President Truman, his definition of leadership, and I was thinking about this, leadership in the home. He says, a leader is a person who has the ability to get others to do what they don't want to do and like it. Get others to do what they don't want to do and like it. And think about parenting, to be so compelling, so winsome, so encouraging, you know, so sacrificial. You could tell your kids to go take out the trash and they would jump 
You know, someday, maybe, that'll happen. <laughs> but, but that's what dads need to be, the chief encouragers, right? The one who says, I'm going to work the hardest. I'm going to study the most. I'm going to be the most prepared, the most thoughtful, the most prayerful. I'm going to have the best pulse on the, the life of my family. Fathers who don't make excuses, but take ownership. Dads, the, the church needs you to be zealous in this leadership and to be humble. In one sense, you could say the future of your children, the future of the church rises and falls with dads. I mean, do we treat our role like that? Mothers, do you treat your role like that? Coming alongside, strengthening, supporting, laboring, working, nurturing night and day. And this is not just fathers and mothers. This is the duty of the church. We have all heard the truth. We have all experienced God's mercy. And these things must not end with us. We must pass them on. Asaph began here with a a call. Will you who have heard? Will you who have heard? Pass this on. And and the congregation answers in verse 4. You have now the, the whole congregation. We will not conceal them. This is the response. We will tell them to the next generation. In verse 4 and 5, in this response, they they give the content. This is what we're going to teach. We will embrace this duty, and now this is what we will teach them. We'll we'll take this mantle and instruct our children. And that brings us to the second pillar here of raising up the next generation is the the curriculum. What is it that we teach them? Verse 4, we will not conceal from our children, but tell them the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. So what is the curriculum for our instruction? The curriculum is God himself, about his character, about his power, about what he has done in history. We tell them stories of God acting to rescue his people. We tell them stories of God's sovereignty. You could paraphrase these. uh, First, the praises of God as his character, his attributes. What makes God glorious and praiseworthy? Secondly, his strength, that is his power and ability, not just to say that God has has the ability to do something, that he wants to. It's one thing to to see a need and be powerless to stop it, to say, oh man, I I can see where this is going. I mean, you read the the tragic story of the the fires in Maui. What makes it even more tragic is that people saw it coming. They couldn't get water there quick enough. They couldn't get emergency responders there quick enough. Well, Well, God not only sees the need, but has the power to act. He is able That is his strength and also his wondrous works that he has done. That is to look back on everything that God has done in Scripture, in your own life, and to say that God has only done good. All that he has ever done is good. As you read forward in this psalm, Asaph, he's going to document God's character. All of these things that he has done, the wonders to part the Red Sea, The the ten plagues of Egypt to deliver God's people, the power on display, his faithfulness to drive out Israel's enemies in the promised land. All these things that God has done. I often feel the need to reiterate with my kids as they're reading Bible stories to say, hey, this is is truth. This actually happened. You you watch movies and superheroes and all these fictional stories. You have to say, hey, no, this is not fiction like those stories. There was actually a Red Sea. God actually parted it. You can go to that same place today. And the curriculum we teach is not just an academic exercise. Not just here, here's the summary of God's attributes. And we're going to see, yeah, yeah, it involves teaching. It involves didactic teaching, opening the scriptures. But you also have to to live these truths. You have to embrace these truths. I mean, this phrase, the the praises of God in verse 4. How could you teach someone about what makes God praiseworthy if you are not one who praises him? You have to be one who worships, who says, yes, God is worthy of praise, to be able to teach that truth. Uh, this summer, I've been reading the, through the biography of John Payton. Uh, he was a missionary to, uh, to an island region in the South Pacific called Vanuatu, uh, east of Australia, and just a really compelling story. He endured so much tragedy and hardship. It was a, a cannibalistic people. And just the amazing stories of, of God's providence as he brings the gospel, but he writes this, it's actually an autobiography, and he writes back years and years later in his 70s, and he's talking about the, the impact that his father had on him, the faith of his father that was so real to him. 
even years and years later. I just want to read you just an excerpt that John Payton writes about his father. He says his father would, would read, every, every day would read the Bible, family worship. Every night he'd, they'd find him in a, a prayer closet in the middle of their home, praying for the family. And this is what he writes. He says, Though everything else in religion were by some unthinkable catastrophe to be swept out of memory, were blotted from my understanding, my soul would wander back to those early scenes and shut itself up once again in that sanctuary closet. And hearing still the echoes of those cries to God would hurl all doubt back with victorious appeal. He walked with God. Why may not I? How much my father's prayers at this time impressed me, I can never explain, nor could any stranger understand. When on his knees and all of us kneeling around him in family worship, he poured out his whole soul with tears for the conversion of the heathen world to the service of Jesus and for every personal and domestic need, we felt as if in the presence of the living Savior, and we learned to know and love him as our divine friend. I just love that statement. He walked with God. Why may not I? To see that kind of vibrant faith. I mean, that's a high calling for a parent. For your kid to say, oh, he has a living relationship with Christ. I want that. Parents, as your kids watch your life, do they see that? Do they see you rejoicing in the character of God? Do they hear you talking about all the wonderful things that God has done for you? Do they see you demonstrating to them that this God who parted the Red Sea, the God who has power over the seas, is the same God who has power over our finances, has power over our health, power over relationships and hard circumstances? You see, verse 4 is not just a memory verse, not something we write on a note card to tell our kids. This is something that we have to believe. This, this passage is a, a cure here, verse 4, for, for any anxiety and worry. Right? If God is good in his character, and if he is able to act on behalf of his people, and if all that he's ever done is good, and if you're one of his children, how can we not trust him? How can we not find our hope in him? So we need to be comforted and strengthened by these truths, and our children need to watch us as we respond to trials to see that these are not just words on a page, but we actually believe these truths. Uh, J.C. Ryle says this of parenting. He says, To give children good instruction and a bad example is but beckoning to them with a head to show them the way to heaven while taking them by the hand and leading them in the way to hell. Pretty, pretty heavy words just to, to say, here's the power of example. Your life must match your words. Throughout Scripture, Always, the, the message and the messenger together. So the curriculum here, teaching them about who God is, about what he has done, a life to match the teaching. And then in verse 5, Asaph moves to, to where, where can we find these mighty acts of God? Where do we find these displays of strength and power? Now, obviously, you know, where do we teach? Where do we find this? What do we teach our children? We teach them this book. We teach them the Bible, the scriptures. Verse 5. He has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children. The, the law and the testimony, the law, God's instruction, this is how you must live. God's character requires this kind of response. His character is reflected in these commands. A testimony, a documentation of what God has done, evidence of his work. These two things together, the law and the testimony, the scriptures, the law, the prophets, the writings, the psalms, all of it. This is the curriculum of what we teach our children. Not just to say, well, here's some rules that God gave us to follow, but to say we are the most privileged people on the planet because God has spoken. He has revealed himself to us. And he has told us how we must live in his presence. So we teach scripture to our kids. We inform their conscience. We drive the nails in deep. At the end of verse 5, I think he's alluding back to Deuteronomy 6 when he says the the command to our fathers that they should teach them to their children. Hearkening back to Deuteronomy 6, what the the Israelites would call the Shema. You know, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you remember the command, you must love the Lord your God. And then Moses goes on to say, Deuteronomy 6, 7, 
These words that I'm commanding you today must be on your heart, and then what must you do? You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them on your hands and your eyes and the doorposts of your house. So this all-consuming endeavor of teaching, uh, breakfast in the morning, driving to school, going to games, going to the store, teaching, teaching, always teaching. All of life is a training ground for this instruction. Uh, my wife and I read the, over the summer this book with some friends called The Christian Home. It's actually at our bookstore in the back, Christian Home. Just a really small resource, but it asks some diagnostic questions of how you're doing as a family, prioritizing what God prioritizes. And I just love some of the questions he asks. Say, if, if indeed, Deuteronomy 6, if we, if we indeed need to instruct our children as a, as a way of life, then do our priorities reflect that? Does our schedule reflect that? Does our, our spending habits reflect that? Do our commitments reflect that? It's just so helpful to, to list out what, what are the things that we, we say we're going after and what are the things that we're actually doing. And maybe we have to reschedule and readjust. Uh, recently, I was asked a, a different kind of question. The question was, you know, have you thought through the things that you want to tell your kids before they leave the house? What are all the things you want them to know? If you're going to list out, okay, when they turn 18, I want them to have learned all of this from me. And now what's your plan to get there? I mean, that's a, that's a lot to consider. There's so many things, Right? I want to help them have these skills. I want, to, I want to help them develop good habits. I want them to have convictions. I want them to, to think through decisions, have a work ethic. I want them to know the Bible. There's so much Bible they need to know before they leave. I want them to have the ability to navigate life. Obviously, the, the foundation for this is Scripture. They have to know the truth. And then giving them the ability to navigate. Now, how do I apply this truth to, to my situations, to my decisions? How do I apply the truth as I look for, for a job, a career, school, as, as I think about friends? And the idea is not that they would just be able to say, okay, I, I do this and this because my parents said so. But they would have the, the principles. This is how my parents worked through this. This is why we, we couldn't watch these kind of movies. Here was the, the truths that were in front of me. This is how they made that decision so that they can grow up and they can make decisions using not just our, our template, but actually using Scripture. So they would have the principles of Scripture to make their own decisions. Because we want them to be able to lead their own family someday. That's where this is going in verse 6. That the generation to come might know, even children yet to be born. So we teach them, verse 5, to our children, so that they would teach it to a, a generation not even born, so that they would be able to disciple the next generation. So we are raising up disciplers, not just those who, who know the truth, but those who can teach the truth. They have to be able to, to lead the next generation. Verse 6, you have uh, four generations in view. You know, we are teaching our, our generation here, the, the kids in this church, the second generation, third generation, their kids, children yet born. And then they may arise, the end of verse 6, and tell their children so that our, our children's children would know, and their children would know. So you think about just the, what it looks like to have this view of generational discipleship. Not just, hey, here's some stuff you need to know, but I want to help you to be a discipler. I want to help you raise up the next generation. And this is exactly what, what Paul talks about in 2 Timothy 2, when he's talking about raising up leaders in the church. He's saying, teach these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others. You know, so you're teaching this to someone who's going to teach somebody else that you've never met. So they have to know all of this truth, but they also have to wrestle with the, the principles. They have to have their own convictions. They have to, to know what they believe after I'm gone. I thought of this example recently. We, uh, more recently, have let, let our oldest go into the, the store sometimes. You know, give a credit card, run into the store, get something. You know, started, I think the first one was that uh, there's a place called Chunk Cookie, right? You drive in front of it, you can see, you know, the cashier from the window. So we're in the car, give them the credit card. You know, you can go in there, order four cookies. You know, it should be something like $12. If they ask for a tip, say no, you know. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, you know, then come right back, you know. And, uh, and he can go in there, you know, and he, he walks in. It's like four. You can see me from the window. Yep, okay, tip, no, no tip, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but but pretty, pretty basic instruction, right? You go in, you come back. But, but imagine now if I was going to tell my son, okay, now tomorrow I want you to go to the grocery store with your sister, 
and I want you to tell her how to go into the store and pay and come back. I'm not going to talk to her. So I want, I, want to, I want you to do that. Imagine now my instruction to him. It's going to look a lot different. You know, if he's now responsible for his sister, I'm going to tell him, okay, well, the credit card's pretty important. You know, don't let that out of your sight. And your sister's pretty important. So you need to, you need to make sure to protect her and be on the, be on the lookout. Right? A different kind of instruction. Hey, do you have my, my phone number memorized? Or all of a sudden, that, the stakes are a lot higher if he's going to teach somebody else. If I'm trying to raise him not just to, to get in and out, but now to be a teacher. We are trying to raise up a, a stronger generation. You know, it's not like the telephone game where I hope by the third person they still have the message. But no, we're saying we want a stronger generation than us. We want to give them all of our, our history and our experience and our learnings so that they would be able to raise up an even stronger generation. I talked about the principle of wealth being squandered by the third generation. And part of that issue is that the, the first generation has a, a different mindset, a different goal. Right? Andrew Carnegie was an immigrant from Scotland. He's just trying to get out of poverty, working hard to provide a better life for himself and his family. And that's often the case, and you read these stories of someone that has this goal of, I'm, I'm going I'm to claw my way out of this situation. In the second generation, they have a different goal. Right? I'm trying to protect what I have. I'm trying to preserve. I don't want my life to change that much. Right? It's a different goal. And as we look at the passage we have to keep the goal in front of us, a singular goal. That's the, the third pillar here. As we think about raising up the next generation is the goal. A goal not just that they would learn truth, not just that they would have Bible knowledge, not just that they would be good citizens, not even just that they would be good parents. The goal in verse 7 of this generation yet to be born, that they should put their confidence in God. Or they should set their hope on God. This is the goal, that they would be God-fearers. That they would personally know this great God. Remember what Jesus says in John chapter 4 to the woman at the well. My father is seeking worshipers. This is what we're trying to raise up. We're trying to raise up worshipers, a generation of those who worship the living God. Training them in the scriptures so that they would see the God of the scriptures. And we discipline and we rebuke and we admonish. But always with this goal. I want you to, to rest in God. I want you to find your confidence in him. But to set their confidence or their hope on God. That is to, to treasure him. To have absolute certainty that he will deliver on his promises. I mean, if you're going to boil down, what's the, the very core of what it means to be a, a follower of the Lord? To be one of God's people, Old and New Testament. I think this phrase one who has confidence in God. You've turned away from trusting in yourself, turned away from your own self-righteousness, turned away from looking at your own strength, from thinking, hey, I can do this on my own, turned away from thinking that you're pretty good, and you've cast yourself completely on the Lord to say, my hope is only in you. I love uh, if, if the Mormon missionaries ever come by our house. It's been a while, but just love to, to have a conversation not about you know, this, this phrase or this phrase, but just to get to the heart of the issue and just to ask them this question. You know, how do you have confidence that you will stand before a holy God? What gives you confidence? You know, when you lay your head on the pillow at night, what is your hope? You know, maybe you need to ask that question of yourself. What is your confidence that you could stand before a holy God after this life? And the only way to have confidence is, is not because you've done enough good things. It's not because you even tried hard to obey, not because you were a, a good child or a good parent, not because you kept rules, not even because you prayed a certain prayer. But, but the one who has saving faith, their only confidence is in the blood of Christ. Say, I am confident in God and his provision. I'm confident that he sent his son I'm confident in Jesus standing in my place. That is our hope. So my hope is in God. And we on this side of the cross know that he has sent his son. Know that we have a mediator who will stand before us. And this is what we teach our children. Your hope must be in God. And the one who hopes in God, look at verse 7, what they do. The one who has their confidence in God. They do not forget the works of God, but they keep his commandments. That is to say, they obey. 
obedience flowing first from this hope. I have been rescued from self-trust, from self-love. I have a new master, and now I want to serve him. I want to follow him. I mean, this changes how we discipline and instruct our kids. Uh, Not telling the kids, you have ultimately disobeyed me. No, you you have actually disobeyed God, who put me as your authority. You need to obey me, not because I have some special power, but because God has put me as your father, so you need to obey him. So if you reject my authority, you're rejecting his authority. That's the issue. So this is the goal we must be motivated by. We want them to see the, the glory of God. We want them to know his son, Jesus Christ. We want them to be worshipers. You know, that puts us in a little bit of a predicament, right? When you, when you hear that, of course we want our kids to believe. And you know this, and I know this, we, we have no power to actually give them faith, right? We can't actually make them worshipers. But what do we have here? We have this goal I want them to hope in God, and we have the the tools. We have the means that God is pleased to use, the the sword of the Spirit. We have his word. So this is the the mandate, to to instruct with Scripture. And we should feel the the weight of this duty, and at the same time, our inability. And that must drive us, to, to I think, to two things. It should drive us to prayer, and it should drive us to urgency. I have no ability to to change them. So night after night, I want to pray. Day after day, I want to open scripture and exhort and correct. And that's going to bring us to the the last pillar here. This is where he goes at the end. Fourth pillar here is the the urgency. Urgency that we need to have. Verse 8 is a a warning. A warning for us not to be like the faithless generations. He he chronicles in, in this psalm all of these mighty acts of God and all of the generations that rejected and rejected and and didn't believe God. There's a warning for us. You must embrace this call. It is not guaranteed. I love this famous address by Ronald Reagan. I think it captures this idea of uh, urgency. You know, not that we're here to to protect freedom, but to to protect, again, to, to, to go after giving our kids truth, to fight for the truth. But he says, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in the United States when men were free. And I share that not to make a a pitch for, for patriotism, but to, to capture the urgency that we are a generation away from losing this. You know, as a nation, that's true, but, but in the church, this is true. A generation away from losing the truth. So there is a, an urgency. There's no, no guarantee because of the family you're in, because of the, the church you grew up in, because of the, the leaders you have, the teaching you have. None of those things guarantee. So we must embrace this call. And he says in verse 8 that there is an ever-present danger of forgetting what God has done. Look at verse 8. They would not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart, whose spirit was not faithful. Asaph is going to tell us, generation after generation, rejected, again rejected. They were not faithful. And the problem here, verse 8, he's going to give us, this is what's going on in the heart. You can see on the outside, clearly they reject God, but what's going on? They did not prepare their heart. This is a heart problem. This is a problem with their affections. This is a problem with their desires. This is a problem with what they love most. Uh, To not prepare their heart, you could read this as to not be steadfast of heart. Or even to, to say they did not stabilize their heart. Their hearts were not steadied. The mighty acts of God, his power, and his character, they could not stabilize their fearful hearts. His miraculous works, parting the Red Sea, the ten plagues of Egypt, did not calm their anxieties. God, when he miraculously drove out the nations in front of them, none of that was enough to to change their desires. God's revelation, his law, his character, did did not give them a, a heart of obedience. They didn't love him. They didn't care. They weren't compelled. It says they were faithless. They were not faithful. So when temptation came, when life got hard, 
when they were faced with trials and burdens, they did not have any confidence in God's character. They did not believe that he is good and he does good. Verse 8 is a reminder that there is, there's no guarantee for the next generation. And this should impress upon us the life and death urgency of this call. And I want to talk just, just for a minute to the youth, the next generation that are in here. Uh, if you're still in the home, he talks about the next generation. That's you, still in the home, being instructed under your parents' roof. You, know, you are one of the most, uh, you could say, privileged generations in the world. And people use that, that phrase a lot. And they mean different things. They might say privilege because you have, you know, resources, technological advancements, wealth, whatever we have in the United States. But, but if you have grown up in this church, if you have grown up with parents that love the Lord, you are in a place of privilege because you have heard so much truth. You have heard truth week after week, day after day, you know, Sunday after Sunday, sitting in the pew. And this verse 8 is a warning for you. It doesn't matter if you're 12 years old, that you have to be responsible for your own soul. You will stand before Christ. And you will stand before Christ alone, without your parents, without your pastor. You must embrace this call. You must embrace Christ. This passage puts a burden on you, not to just coast by, not to just show up here and go through the motions, but to actually believe in the Lord Jesus to take responsibility for your own soul. I love what Charles Spurgeon says, his mother used to pray in front of him. He says his mother used to pray in front of the kids. Now, Lord, if my children go on in their sins, it will not be from ignorance that they perish. And my soul must bear a swift witness against them at the day of judgment if they lay not hold of Christ. His mother saying, if you reject Christ, I will stand with him against you. So you students, you have the the witness of faithful parents. You have the truth. So will you be a generation that stands for Christ in a hostile world, in a changing world? You know, where are the next uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the teens that left their home and were able to to be persecuted for righteousness, that believed the truth and loved God? Will you be the generation that rises up to tell your children the mighty acts of God, about his character and his deeds and his goodness, and that he has come. He sent his son to save sinners. Will you be that generation? I love this passage because it brings us to this fork in the road moment. Like Joshua, when he's assembling the people after they've conquered the land of Canaan. You remember what he says, choose this day whom you will serve. I think that's what this passage does for us. Ask this question, choose this day whom you will serve. The answer, you know, resounding, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what he's driving at here. Will you, the people of God, will you resolve again today to to raise up another generation, the the next generation of moms and dads, the next generation of pastors and teachers, the next generation of missionaries, church planters, the the next generation of of gospelizers, those that will go into their communities and spread the, the good news of Jesus Christ. And you might be here this morning uh, hearing this, uh, maybe struggling, maybe looking at this passage and saying, you know, I I haven't done this well. Uh, I failed over and over again. Well, what's wonderful about this passage is where Asaph goes back to over and over again, despite all of the the failings of Israel, despite the faithlessness of the people, even where he ends the passage, that there is a, a faithful God, a God who keeps his promises even ends the passage with a promise to David, a promise that there is a Davidic line, a king to sit on the throne. You know, on this side of the cross, we know that line has ended with Jesus, that he is the king, that God has been true to his promise, that he has been faithful. So if you're struggling, maybe you can look back and say, you know, I've failed in so many of these areas. I've not led my home well. I've not instructed my kids well. We serve a God whose mercies are new every morning, a God who is faithful. And what's life-giving for a home is for a, a father, for a mother, to humbly say, you know, you know, I've failed, I haven't done this well. Would you forgive me? And what do your kids need to see? 
They need to see you tomorrow live a life of faith as you confess sin, as you walk in repentance. And what's that look like tomorrow for the one who is humble, the one who confesses to God his weakness, his frailty? Tomorrow, what, did that, what does that person do? Well, they, they rely on the strength of God. They rely on the mighty power of God. They get up tomorrow, one decision at a time, one moment at a time, one day at a time, say, I want to walk in obedience to this great God. So I want to end here this morning, just back where, where Asaph starts, this, this call to worship, the, this question. You know, will you here, who have heard, who have been taught, who have learned these things, will you embrace this mandate? Will you embrace this mandate to, to raise up another generation of those who fear the Lord? And let me close our time in prayer and just that our answer, pray that our answer indeed would be, we will. We will not conceal these things, but we will teach them to our children. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for these weighty truths, uh, these encouraging truths, uh, for this high calling. Uh, I just pray for this church, for Grace Bible Church, that we would embrace this duty, this obligation, this privilege that we have to raise up another generation. I pray that people would look in on this church and they would see strong families. And what would be on display is not that we have uh, some, some parental instruction figured out. We have some method figured out, Lord. But we pray that what would be on display is Jesus, is uh, lives that have been impacted by his grace. Families that are living in submission to him. Families that are, are quick to share the, the good news of the gospel. That have thankful hearts. So I pray that you would strengthen us this week in our efforts. I pray that we would rely on your power and your goodness and your grace. I pray that we'd be rooted in your word and all of this, Jesus, so that you would get the glory. So that generations from now, that even from this church, we think about Revelation chapter 5, there would be those around the throne, generations from now, from this church, saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain. So Jesus, we pray all these things in your name for your glory. Amen.